From Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday morning session of the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday morning session of the 190th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and extend a warm welcome to members and friends participating in this conference throughout the world. We're particularly grateful today for the technology which allows us to move forward with the conference. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We are grateful to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the first vision and the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which followed. We acknowledge the blessings and goodness that are part of our lives today because of a heartfelt prayer offered by Joseph Smith in the spring of 1820 from Palmyra, New York. We pray that this conference will provide a way for all of us to reflect upon this unique event and that we will continue in our efforts to spread the message of the restoration throughout the world. The music for all sessions of the conference will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. The music has been pre-recorded and will be under the direction of various conductors and organists. The choir opened this meeting with Awake and Arise and will now favor us with the morning breaks and the invocation will then be offered by Elder Richard J. Maines of the 70, after which the choir will sing It Is Well With My Soul.
our beloved Heavenly Father, we express unto thee this morning our sincere gratitude for this historic General Conference weekend where we commemorate the 200th anniversary year of thy appearance and the appearance of thy son Jesus Christ to the prophet Joseph Smith. We are grateful, Father, for the eternal truths learned from that sacred and holy event. We are grateful for the prophet Joseph Smith and all that he accomplished in the early days of the Restoration. We are grateful for our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. We love him, and we pray that we might successfully follow his inspired counsel in our day. Now, Father, we recognize the many challenges throughout the world, especially this COVID-19 pandemic. We pray thy gift of inspiration to be with all those who are working diligently to find solutions to this virus. We pray thy healing influence to be with all those who are suffering due to this disease. Now, Father, we are grateful for the opportunity we've had to spiritually prepare for this conference. And we pray thy spirit to be with all of us in abundance at this very special occasion. We love thee, Father, and we love thy son, Jesus Christ. And we say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
It will now be our privilege to hear from our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. He will be followed by President M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We will then hear from Elder James R. Rasband of the Seventy and Sister Joy D. Jones, primary general president. My beloved brothers and sisters, as we welcome you to this historic April 2020 General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For reasons you know, I stand before you in an empty auditorium. Little did I know when I promised you at the October 2019 General Conference that this April conference would be memorable and unforgettable as speaking to a visible congregation of fewer than 10 people would make this conference so memorable and unforgettable for me. Yet the knowledge that you are participating by electronic transmission and the choir's beautiful rendition of It Is Well With My Soul bring great comfort to my soul. As you know, Attendance at this general conference has been strictly limited as part of our efforts to be good global citizens and do all we can to limit the spread of COVID-19. This virus has had a major impact throughout the world. It has also altered our church meetings, missionary service, and temple work for a while. Though today's restrictions relate to a virulent virus, life's personal trials stretch far beyond this pandemic. Future trials could result from an accident, a natural disaster, or an unexpected personal heartache. How can we endure such trials? The Lord has told us that if ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. Of course, we can store our own reserves of food, water, and savings. But equally crucial is our need to fill our personal spiritual storehouses with faith, truth, and testimony. Our ultimate quest in life is to prepare to meet our Maker. We do this by striving daily to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we do that as we repent daily and receive His cleansing, healing, and strengthening power. Then we can feel enduring peace and joy, even during turbulent times. This is exactly why the Lord has implored us to stand in holy places and be not moved. This year, we commemorate the 200th anniversary of one of the most significant events in the history of the world, namely, the appearance of God the Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to Joseph Smith. During that singular vision, God the Father pointed to Jesus Christ and said, This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. That admonition given to Joseph is for each of us. We are to seek in every way we can to hear Jesus Christ, who speaks to us through the power and ministering of the Holy Ghost. The purpose of this and every general conference is to help us to hear him. We have prayed and invite you to pray that the Spirit of the Lord will be with us in such rich abundance that you can hear the messages that the Savior has especially for you. Messages that will bring peace to your soul. Messages that will heal your broken heart. Messages that will illuminate your mind. Messages that will help you know what to do as you move ahead through times of turmoil and trial. 
We pray that this conference will be memorable and unforgettable because of the messages you will hear, the unique announcements which will be made, and the experiences in which you will be invited to participate. For example, at the conclusion of the Sunday morning session, we will convene a worldwide solemn assembly when I will lead you in the sacred Hosanna shout. We pray that this will be a spiritual highlight for you as we express in global unison our profound gratitude to God the Father and his beloved Son by praising them in this unique way. For this sacred experience, we use clean white handkerchiefs. But if you do not have one, you may simply wave your hand. At the conclusion of the Hosanna shout, the congregation will join with the choir in singing the Spirit of God. My dear brothers and sisters, this conference will be magnificent. This year will be extraordinary as we focus intently on the Savior and His restored gospel. The most important lasting effects of this historic conference will be as our hearts change and we commence a lifelong quest to hear Him. Welcome to April 2020 General Conference. I know that God our Heavenly Father and His Son Jesus Christ are mindful of us. They will be with us throughout the proceedings of these two glorious days as we seek to draw closer to them and honor them. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you very much, President, for such a wonderful opening. Brothers and sisters, 215 years ago, a little boy was born to Joseph and Lucy Mack Smith in Vermont, in a region known as New England in northern United States. Joseph and Lucy Mack believed in Jesus Christ, studied the Holy Scriptures, sincerely prayed, and walked with faith in God. They named their new baby son Joseph Smith, Jr. Of the Smith family, Brigham Young said, the Lord has his eye upon Joseph Smith and upon his father and upon his father's father and upon their progenitors clear back to Abraham and from Abraham to the flood, from the flood to Enoch and from Enoch to Adam. He has watched that family and that blood as it has circulated from the fountain to the birth of that man. Joseph Smith was foreordained in eternity. Beloved by his family, Joseph Jr. was particularly close to his older brother Hiram, who was six years of age when Joseph was born. Last October, I sat by the hearthstone that was in the small Smith home in Sharon, Vermont, where Joseph was born. I felt Hiram's love for Joseph and thought of him holding his baby brother in his arms and teaching him how to walk. Father and Mother Smith experienced personal setbacks, forcing them to move their family numerous times before finally giving up on New England and making the courageous decision to move farther west in New York State. Because the family was united, they survived these challenges and together faced the daunting task of starting over again on a 100-acre wooded tract of land in Manchester near Palmyra, New York. I'm not sure that many of us realize the physical and emotional challenges that starting over presented the Smith family. Clearing land, planting orchards and fields, building a small log home and other farm structures, hiring out as day laborers and making home goods to sell in town. By the time the family arrived in western New York, the area was ablaze with religious fervor, known as the Second Great Awakening. During this time of debate and strife among religious parties, 
Joseph experienced a wondrous vision known today as the first vision. We are blessed to have four primary accounts from which I will draw. Joseph recorded during this time of great religious excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness, but through my feelings, though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties. Though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit, Yet so great were the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person, young as I was, and so unacquainted with men and things, to come to any certain conclusion which was right, who was right and who was wrong. Joseph turned to the Bible to find answers to his questions and read James 1 and 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. He noted, Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of a man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again. Joseph came to realize that the Bible did not contain all the answers to life's questions. Rather, it taught men and women how they could find answers to their questions by communicating directly with God through prayer. He added, So in accordance with this, my determination to ask of God I retired to the woods to make an attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful clear day, early in the spring of 1820. Soon thereafter, Joseph said that a pillar of light rested upon me, and I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear him. The Savior then spoke, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way. Walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Joseph added, No sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak, then I, at, then I asked personages who stood above me in the, in the light, which of all the sects was right? He recalled, they told me, that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and that none of them had the acknowledged, was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom. And at the same time, I received a promise that the fullness of the gospel should some future time be made known unto me. Joseph also noted, I saw many angels in this vision. Following this glorious vision, Joseph wrote, My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy. The Lord was with me. He emerged from the sacred grove to begin his preparation to become a prophet of God. Joseph also began to learn what ancient prophets experienced, rejection, opposition, and persecution. Joseph recalls sharing what he had seen and heard with one of the ministers who had been active in the religious revival. It was greatly, I was greatly surprised at his behavior. He treated my communications not only lightly, but with great contempt, saying it was all of the devil, that there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days that all such things had ceased with the apostles, 
and that there would never be any more of them. I soon found, my, found however, that my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against me among professors of religion and was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase. And this was common among all sects, all united to persecute me. Three years later, in 1823, the heavens opened again as part of the continuing restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the last days. Joseph noted that an angel named Moroni appeared to him and said that God had a work for me to do and that there was a book deposited written upon gold plates that contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants of the Americas. Eventually, Joseph obtained, translated, and published the ancient record known today as the Book of Mormon. His brother Hiram, who had been his constant supporter, especially following his painful, life-threatening leg operation in 1813, was one of the witnesses of the gold plates. He was also one of the six members of the Church of Jesus Christ when it was organized in 1830. During their lives, Joseph and Hiram faced mobs and persecution together. For example, they languished in the most wretched conditions in the Liberty Jail in Missouri for five months during the cold winter of 1838 and 39. In April 1839, Joseph wrote his wife Emma Describing, describing their situation in Liberty Jail. I believe it is now about five months and six days since I have been under the grimace of a guard night and day and within the walls, grates, and screeching iron doors of a lonesome, dark, dirty prison. We shall be moved from this place at any rate, and we are glad of it. Let what will become of us. We cannot get into a worse hole than this is. We shall never cast a lingering wish after liberty in Clay County, Missouri. We have enough of it to last forever. In face of persecution, Hiram exhibited faith in the Lord's promise, including a guarantee to escape his enemies, if so, he so chose. In a blessing Hiram received in 1835 under the hands of Joseph Smith, the Lord promised him, Thou shalt have power to escape the hand of thine enemies. Thy life shall be sought with untiring zeal, but thou shalt escape. If it please thee and thou desirest, thou shalt have the power to voluntarily to lay down thy life to glorify God. In June 1844, Hiram was presented the choice to live or to lay down his life to glorify God and to seal his testimony with his blood side by side together with his beloved brother Joseph. A week before the fateful trip to Carthage, where they were murdered in cold blood by an armed mob of cowards who had painted their faces to avoid detection, Joseph recorded that, I advise my brother Hiram to take his family on the next steamboat and go to Cincinnati. I still feel great emotion as I remember Hiram's reply, Joseph, I can't leave you. So Joseph and Hiram went to Carthage, where they became martyrs for Christ's cause and name. The official announcement of the martyrdom stated the following. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has brought forth the Book of Mormon, which he translated by the gift and power of God, and has been the means of publishing it on two continents has set the fullness of the everlasting gospel. 
which it contains to the four quarters of the earth, has brought forth the revelations and commandments which compose this book of doctrine and covenants, and many other wise documents and instructions for the benefit of the children of men, gathered many thousands of Latter-day Saints, founded a great city, and left a fame and name that cannot be slain. And like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, Joseph has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood, and so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated. Following the martyrdom, Joseph and Hiram's bodies were returned to Nauvoo, washed and dressed, so the family could see their loved ones. Their precious mother recalled, I had for a long time braced every nerve, roused every energy of my soul, and called upon God to strengthen me. But when I entered the room and saw my murdered sons, extended both at once before my eyes, and heard the sobs and groans of my family and the cries from the lips of their wives, children, brothers, and sisters, it was too much. I sank back crying to the Lord in agony of my soul. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken this family? At that moment of sorrow and distress, she recalled them saying, Mother, weep not for us. We have overcome the world by love. They indeed did overcome the world. Joseph and Hiram Smith, like those faithful saints described in the book of Revelations, came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb and are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. As we celebrate this joyous occasion, the 200th anniversary of the first vision, we should always remember the price Joseph and Hiram Smith paid, along with so many other faithful men and women and children, to establish the church so you and I could have and enjoy the many blessings and all of these revealed truths that we have today. Their faithfulness should never be forgotten. I've often wondered why Joseph and Hiram and their families had to suffer so much. It may be that they came to know God through their suffering in ways that could not have happened without it. Through it, they reflected on Gethsemane and the cross of the Savior. As Paul said, For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Before his death in 1844, Joseph wrote a spirited letter to the saints. It was a call to action which continues in the church today. Brethren and sisters, Shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backward. Courage, brothers and sisters, on and on to the victory. Let us therefore as a church and a people and as Latter-day Saints offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. As we listen to the Spirit during this 200th anniversary celebration this weekend, consider what offering you will present to the Lord in righteousness in the coming days. Be courageous. Share it with someone you trust, and most importantly, 
please take time to do it. I know that the Savior is pleased when we present him an offering from our hearts in righteousness, just as he was pleased with the faithful offering of those remarkable brothers, Joseph and Hiram Smith, and all other faithful saints. Of this I solemnly testify in the sacred and holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Last October, President Russell M. Nelson challenged us to consider how our lives would be different if the knowledge we'd gained from the Book of Mormon were suddenly taken away. I've pondered on his question, as I'm sure many of you have. One thought has come again and again. Without the Book of Mormon and its clarity about the doctrine of Christ and his atoning sacrifice, where would I turn for peace? The doctrine of Christ which consists of the saving principles and ordinances of faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end, is taught numerous times in all the scriptures of the Restoration, but with particular power in the Book of Mormon. The doctrine begins with faith in Christ, and every one of its elements depends upon trust in his atoning sacrifice. As President Nelson has taught, the Book of Mormon provides the fullest and most authoritative understanding of the atonement of Jesus Christ to be found anywhere." Close quote. The more we understand about the Savior's supernal gift, the more we will come to know, in our minds and in our hearts, the reality of President Nelson's assurance that the truths of the Book of Mormon have the power to heal, comfort, restore, succor, strengthen, console, and cheer our souls. A vital and peace-giving contribution of the Book of Mormon to our understanding of the Savior's atonement is its teaching that Christ's merciful sacrifice fulfills all the demands of justice. As Alma explained, God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. The Father's plan of mercy, what the scriptures also call the plan of happiness or the plan of salvation, could not be accomplished unless all the demands of justice were satisfied. But what exactly are the demands of justice? Consider Alma's own experience. Remember that as a young man, Alma went about seeking to destroy the church. In fact, Alma told his son Helaman that he was tormented with the pains of hell because he had effectively, quote, murdered many of God's children by leading them away unto destruction, close quote. Alma explained to Helaman that peace finally came to him when his mind caught hold on his father's teaching concerning the coming of Jesus Christ to atone for the sins of the world. A penitent Alma pleaded for Christ's mercy and then felt joy and relief when he realized that Christ had atoned for his sins and paid all that justice required. Again, what would justice have required of Alma? As Alma himself later taught, no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. Thus, part of Alma's relief must have been that unless mercy interceded, justice would have prevented him from returning to live with Heavenly Father. But was Alma's joy focused solely on himself, on his avoiding punishment, and his being able to return to the Father. We know that Alma also agonized about those whom he had led away from the truth. But Alma himself could not heal and restore all those he had led away. He could not himself ensure that they would be given a fair opportunity to learn the doctrine of Christ and to be blessed by living its joyful principles. He could not himself bring back those who may have died still blinded by his false teaching. As President Boyd K. Packer once taught, the thought that rescued Alma is this, restoring what you cannot restore, healing the wound you cannot heal, fixing that which you broke and you cannot fix is the very purpose of the atonement of Christ." Close quote. The joyous truth on which Alma's mind caught hold 
was not just that he himself could be made clean, but also that those whom he had harmed could be healed and made whole. Years before Alma was rescued by this reassuring doctrine, King Benjamin had taught about the breadth of healing offered by the Savior's atoning sacrifice. King Benjamin declared that glad tidings of great joy were given him by an angel from God. Among those glad tidings was the truth that Christ would suffer and die for our sins and mistakes to ensure that, quote, a righteous judgment might come upon the children of men, close quote. What exactly does a righteous judgment require? In the very next verse, King Benjamin explained that to ensure a righteous judgment, the Savior's blood atoned for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam and for those who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them or who have ignorantly sinned. A righteous judgment also required, he taught, that the blood of Christ atoned for the sins of little children. These scriptures teach a glorious doctrine. The Savior's atoning sacrifice heals as a free gift those who sin in ignorance, those to whom, as Jacob put it, there is no law given. Accountability for sin depends on the light we have been given and hinges on our ability to exercise our agency. We know this healing and comforting truth only because of the Book of Mormon and other restoration scripture. Of course, where there is a law given, where we are not ignorant of the will of God, we are accountable. As King Benjamin emphasized, woe unto him who knoweth that he rebelleth against God, for salvation cometh to none such except it be through repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. This too is glad tidings of the doctrine of Christ. Not only does the Savior heal and restore those who sin in ignorance, but also for those who sin against the light, the Savior offers healing on the condition of repentance and faith in him. Alma must have caught hold of both these truths. Would Alma truly have felt what he describes as exquisite joy if he thought that Christ saved him but left forever harmed those he had led away from the truth? Surely not. For Alma to feel complete peace, those he harmed also needed the opportunity to be made whole. But how exactly would they, or those we may harm, be made whole? Although we do not fully understand the sacred mechanics by which the Savior's atoning sacrifice heals and restores, we do know that to ensure a righteous judgment, the Savior will clear away the underbrush of ignorance and the painful thorns of hurt caused by others. By this, he assures that all God's children will be given the opportunity with unobscured vision to choose to follow him and accept the great plan of happiness. It is these truths that would have brought Alma peace, and it is these truths that should bring us great peace as well. As natural men and women, we all bump or sometimes crash into each other and cause harm. As any parent can testify, the pain associated with our mistakes is not simply the fear of our own punishment, but the fear that we may have limited our children's joy or in some way hindered them from seeing and understanding the truth. The glorious promise of the Savior's atoning sacrifice is that as far as our mistakes as parents are concerned, he holds our children blameless and promises healing for them. And even when they have sinned against the light, as we all do, his arm of mercy is outstretched and he will redeem them if they will but look to him and live. Although the Savior has power to mend what we cannot fix, he commands us to do all we can to make restitution as part of our repentance. Our sins and mistakes displace not only our relationship with God, but also our relationship with others. Sometimes our efforts to heal and restore may be as simple as an apology, but other times restitution may require years of humble effort. Yet for many of our sins and mistakes, we simply are not able to fully heal those we have hurt. The magnificent peace-giving promise of the Book of Mormon and the restored gospel is that the Savior will mend all that we have broken, and he will also mend us if we turn to him in faith and repent of the harm we have caused. He offers both of these gifts because he loves all of us with perfect love, 
and because he is committed to ensuring a righteous judgment that honors both justice and mercy. I testify this is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I'm grateful to focus my remarks today on women's continuing roles in the Restoration. It is clear that throughout history, women have held a distinctive place in our Heavenly Father's plan. President Russell M. Nelson taught it would be impossible to measure the influence that women have, not only on families, but also on the Lord's Church, as wives, mothers, and grandmothers, as sisters and aunts, as teachers and leaders, and especially as exemplars and devout defenders of the faith." Close quote. In the Early Relief Society in Nauvoo 178 years ago, the prophet Joseph Smith counseled the sisters to live up to their privileges. Their example teaches us today. They unitedly followed a prophet's voice and lived with steadfast faith in Jesus Christ as they helped lay the foundation we now stand upon. Sisters, it is our turn. We have a divine errand from the Lord and our faithful, unique contributions are vital. President Spencer W. Kimball explained, to be a righteous woman during the winding up scenes on this earth before the second coming of our Savior is an especially noble calling. The righteous woman's strength and influence today can be tenfold what it might be in more tranquil times." Close quote. President Nelson has likewise implored, I plead with my sisters of the church to step forward. Take your rightful and needful place in your home, in your community, and in the kingdom of God more than you ever have before." Close quote. Recently, I was privileged, along with a group of primary children, to meet with President Russell M. Nelson in the replica of the Smith family home in Palmyra, New York. Listen as our beloved prophet teaches the children what they can do to step forward. I'm curious to know if you might have a question that you would like to ask President Nelson. You're sitting here with the prophet. Is there anything that you've always wanted to ask a prophet? Yes, Pearl. Um, is it hard to be a prophet? I'm like really busy. Of course it's hard. Everything to do with becoming more like the Savior is difficult. For example, when God wanted to give the Ten Commandments to Moses, where did he tell Mo Moses to go? Up on top of a mountain, on the top of Mount Sinai. So Moses had to walk all the way up to the top of that mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Now, Heavenly Father could have said, Moses, you start there and I'll start here and I'll meet you halfway. <laughs> no, the Lord loves effort because effort brings rewards that can't come without it. For example, do you ever take piano lessons? I take yeah. part of violin. And do you practice? Yes. What happens if you don't practice? You forget. Yeah, you don't progress, do you? So the answer is yes, Pearl. It takes effort, a lot of hard work, a lot of study, and there's never an end. That's good. That's good. Because we're always progressing. Even in the next life, we're making progress. President Nelson's response to these precious children extends to each one of us. The Lord loves effort, and effort brings rewards. We keep practicing. We are always progressing as long as we are striving to follow the Lord. He doesn't expect perfection today. We keep climbing our personal Mount Sinai. As in times past, our journey does indeed take effort, hard work, and study, but our commitment to progress brings eternal rewards. What more do we learn from the Prophet Joseph Smith and the first vision about effort, 
hard work, and study. The first vision gives us direction in our unique continuing roles. As women of faith, we can draw principles of truth from the Prophet Joseph's experiences that provide insights for receiving our own revelation. For example, we labor under difficulties. We turn to the scriptures to receive wisdom to act. We demonstrate our faith and trust in God. We exert our power to plead with God to help us thwart the adversary's influence. We offer up the desires of our hearts to God. We focus on his light guiding our life choices and resting upon us when we turn to him. We realize he knows each of us by name and has individual roles for us to fulfill. In addition, Joseph Smith restored the knowledge that we have divine potential and eternal worth. Because of that relationship with our Heavenly Father, I believe he expects us to receive revelation from him. The Lord instructed Emma Smith to receive the Holy Ghost, learn much, lay aside the things of this world, seek for the things of a better, and cleave unto her covenants with God. Learning is integral to progression, especially as the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost teaches us what is needful for each of us to lay aside, meaning that which could distract us or delay our progression. President Nelson said, I plead with you to increase your spiritual capacity to receive revelation, close quote. Our prophet's words are continually with me as I contemplate women's ability to step forward. He pleads with us, which indicates priority. He is teaching us how to survive spiritually in a sin-sick world by receiving and acting on revelation. As we do so, honoring and living the Lord's commandments, we are promised, even as Emma Smith, a crown of righteousness. The prophet Joseph taught of the importance of knowing that the path we are pursuing in this lifetime is approved of God. Without that knowledge, we will grow weary in our minds and faint. In this conference, we will hear truths that inspire us to change, improve, and purify our lives. Through personal revelation, we can prevent what some call general conference overwhelm when we leave so determined to do it all now. Women wear many hats, but it is impossible and unnecessary to wear them all at once. The Spirit helps us determine which work to focus on today. The Lord's loving influence through the Holy Ghost helps us know His priority for our progression. Heeding personal revelation leads to personal progression. We listen and act. The Lord said, Ask the Father in my name in faith, believing that you shall receive, and you shall have the Holy Ghost, which manifesteth all things which are expedient. Our continuing role is to receive continuing revelation. As we attain a greater degree of proficiency at doing so, we can receive more power in our individual roles to minister and accomplish the work of salvation and exaltation, to truly lay aside the things of this world and seek for the things of a better. We can then more effectively inspire our rising generation to do the same. Brothers and sisters, we all seek God's power in our lives. There is beautiful unity between women and men in accomplishing God's work today. We access the power of the priesthood through covenants made first in the waters of baptism and then within the walls of holy temples. President Nelson taught us, every woman and every man who makes covenants with God and keeps those covenants and who participates worthily in priesthood ordinances has direct access to the power of God." Close quote. My personal admission today 
is that as a woman, I didn't realize earlier in my life that I had access through my covenants to the power of the priesthood. Sisters, I pray that we will recognize and cherish priesthood power as we cleave unto our covenants, embrace the truths of the scriptures, and heed the words of our living prophets. Let us boldly declare our devotion to our Heavenly Father and our Savior with unshaken faith in Him, relying wholly upon the merits of Him who is mighty to save. Let us joyfully continue this journey toward our highest spiritual potential and help those around us to do the same through love, service, leadership, and compassion. Elder James E. Talmadge tenderly reminded us, the world's greatest champion of woman and womanhood is Jesus the Christ, close quote. In the final analysis of women's continuing roles in the Restoration, and for us all, what role is preeminent? I testify that it is to hear Him, to follow Him, to trust Him, and to become an extension of His love. I know He lives in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we invite you, wherever you are, to join the choir in singing, Come Ye Children of the Lord. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and he will be followed by Brother Douglas D. Holmes, First Counselor in the Young Men General Presidency. This is the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Eighteen years after the first vision, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote an extensive account of his experience. 
He had faced opposition, persecution, harassment, threats, and brutal attacks. Yet he continued to boldly testify of his first vision. I had actually seen a light, and in the midst of that light I saw two personages, and they did in reality speak to me. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. In his difficult hours, Joseph's memory reached back nearly two decades to the certainty of God's love for him and the events that welcomed in the long foretold restoration. Reflecting on his spiritual journey, Joseph said, I don't blame anyone for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I would not have believed it myself. But the experiences were real, and he never forgot or denied them, quietly confirming his testimony as he moved to Carthage. I'm going like a lamb to the slaughter, he said. But I am calm as the summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward all men. There is a lesson for us in the prophet Joseph's example. Along with the peaceful direction we receive from the Holy Ghost, from time to time, God powerfully and very personally assures each of us that he knows us and loves us and that he is blessing us specifically and openly. Then, in our moments of difficulty, the Savior brings these experiences back into our mind. Think of your own life. Over the years, I have listened to thousands of profoundly spiritual experiences from Latter-day Saints all across the world, confirming to me beyond any question that God knows and loves each of us and that he eagerly desires to reveal himself to us. These experiences may come at pivotal times in our lives or in what may at first seem as uneventful happenings but they are always accompanied by an exceptionally strong spiritual confirmation of the love of God. Remembering these spiritually defining experiences take us to our knees, declaring as did the prophet Joseph, what I received was from heaven. I know it, and I know that God knows that I know it. Reflect on your own spiritually defining memories as I share a few examples from others. Years ago, an elderly stake patriarch with two failing heart valves pleaded with then Dr. Russell M. Nelson to intervene. Although at the time there was not a surgical solution for the damaged second valve, Dr. Nelson finally agreed to do the surgery. Here are President Nelson's words. After relieving the obstruction of the first valve, we exposed the second valve. We found it to be intact, but so badly dilated that it could no longer function as it should. While examining this valve, a message was distinctly impressed upon my mind. Reduce the circumference of the ring. I announced that message to my assistant. The valve tissue will be sufficient if we can effectively reduce the ring toward its normal size. But how? A picture came vividly to my mind, showing how stitches could be placed to make a pleat here and a tuck there. I still remember that mental image, complete with dotted lines where sutures should be placed. The repair was completed as diagrammed in my mind. We tested the valve and found the leak to be reduced remarkably. My assistant said, it's a miracle. The patriarch lived for many years. Dr. Nelson had been directed and he knew that God knew that he knew he had been directed. Kathy and I first met Beatrice Magre in France 30 years ago. 
Beatrice recently told me of an experience that impacted her spiritual life shortly after her baptism as a teenager. Here are her words. The youth of our branch had traveled with their leaders to Lacano Beach, an hour and a half from Bordeaux. Before returning home, one of the leaders decided to take a last swim and dove into the waves with his glasses. When he resurfaced, his glasses had disappeared. They were lost in the ocean. The loss of his glasses would prevent him from driving his car. We would be stranded far from home. A sister filled with faith suggested that we pray. I murmured that praying would avail us absolutely nothing, and I uneasily joined the group to pray publicly as we stood waist deep in the murky water. Once the prayer was over, I stretched my arms to splash everyone. As I was sweeping the ocean surface, his pair of glasses rested in my hand. A powerful feeling pierced my soul that God does actually hear and answer our prayers. Forty-five years later, she recalled it as if it had happened yesterday. Beatrice had been blessed, and she knew that God knew that she knew that she had been blessed. The experiences of President Nelson and Sister Magre were very different, yet for both, an unforgettable, spiritually defining memory of God's love was embedded in their hearts. These defining events often come in learning about the restored gospel or in sharing the gospel with others. This picture was taken in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2004. Floripi's Luzia Damasio of the Ipatinga Brazil stake was 114 years old. Speaking of her conversion, Sister Damasio told me that missionaries in her village had given a priesthood blessing to a critically ill baby who miraculously recovered. She wanted to know more. As she prayed about their message, an undeniable witness of the Spirit confirmed to her that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. At 103, she was baptized, and at 104, she was endowed. Every year after, she made the 14-hour bus ride to spend a week in the temple. Sister Damasio had received a heavenly confirmation, and she knew that God knew that she knew that the witness was true. Here's a spiritual memory from my first mission to France 48 years ago. While tracting, my companion and I left a Book of Mormon with an elderly woman. Returning to the woman's apartment about a week later, she opened the door. Before any words were spoken, I felt a tangible spiritual power. The intense feelings continued as Madame Alice Audubert invited us in and told us she had read the Book of Mormon and knew that it was true. As we left her apartment that day, I prayed, Heavenly Father, please help me to never forget what I have just felt. I never have. <clears throat> In a seemingly ordinary moment, at a door much, much like hundreds of other doors, I had felt the power of heaven. And I knew that God knew that I knew that a window of heaven had been opened. These spiritually defining moments come at different times and in different ways, individualized for each of us. Think of your favorite examples in the scriptures. Those listening to the Apostle Peter were pricked in their hearts. The Lamanite woman, Abish, believed the remarkable vision of her father and a voice came into the mind of Enos. My friend, Clayton Christensen, 
described and experienced during a very prayerful reading of the Book of Mormon this way. A beautiful, warm, loving spirit surrounded me and permeated my soul, enveloping me in a feeling of love that I had not imagined I could feel. And these feelings continued night after night. There are times when spiritual feelings go down into our heart like fire, illuminating our soul. Joseph Smith explained that we sometimes receive sudden strokes of ideas and occasionally the pure flow of intelligence. President Dallin H. Oaks, in responding to a sincere man who claimed never to have had such an experience, counseled, perhaps your prayers have been answered again and again, but you have had your expectations fixed on a sign so grand or a voice so loud that you think you have had no answer. The Savior himself spoke of a people with great faith who were blessed with fire and with the Holy Ghost, but who knew it not. We have recently heard President Russell M. Nelson say, I invite you to think deeply and often about this key question. How do you hear him? I also invite you to take steps to hear him better and more often. He repeated that invitation this morning. We hear him in our prayers, in our homes, in the scriptures, in our hymns, as we worthily partake of the sacrament, as we declare our faith, as we serve others, and as we attend the temple with fellow believers. Spiritually defining moments come as we prayerfully listen to general conference and as we better keep the commandments. And children, these experiences are for you as well. Remember, Jesus did teach and minister unto the children, and the children did speak great and marvelous things. The Lord said, this knowledge is given by my spirit unto you, and save it were by my power, you could not have it. Wherefore, you can testify that you have heard my voice and know my words. We can hear him because of the blessing of the Savior's incomparable atonement. While we cannot choose the timing of receiving these defining moments, President Henry B. Eyring gave this counsel in our preparation. Tonight and tomorrow night, you might pray and ponder, asking the questions, did God send a message that was just for me? Did I see his hand in my life or the lives of my family? Faith, obedience, humility, and real intent open the windows of heaven. You might think of your spiritual memories this way. With constant prayer, a determination to keep our covenants, and the gift of the Holy Ghost, we navigate our way through life. When personal difficulty, doubt, or discouragement darken our path, or when the world conditions beyond our control lead us to to wonder about the future. The spiritually defining memories from our book of life are like luminous stones that help brighten the road ahead, assuring us that God knows us, loves us, and has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to help us return home. And when someone sets his or her defining memories aside and is lost or confused, we turn them toward the Savior as we share our faith and memories with them, helping them rediscover those precious spiritual moments they once treasured. Some experiences are so sacred that we guard them in our spiritual memory and do not share them. Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Angels have not ceased to minister 
unto the children of men. For behold, they are subject unto Christ to minister according to his command, showing themselves unto them of strong faith and a firm mind in every form of godliness. And the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Embrace your sacred memories. Believe them. Write them down. Share them with your family. Trust that they come to you from your heavenly Father and his beloved Son. Let them bring patience to your doubts and understanding to your difficulties. I promise you that as you willingly acknowledge and carefully treasure the spiritually defining events in your life, more and more will come to you. Heavenly Father knows you and loves you. Jesus is the Christ. His gospel has been restored. And as we remain faithful, eyewitness, we will be his forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, what a wonderful time we live in. As we celebrate the beginning of the restoration, it is also appropriate to celebrate the ongoing restoration that we are witnessing. I rejoice with you to live in this day. The Lord continues to put in place through his prophets all that is needed to help us prepare to receive him. One of those needed things is the New Children and Youth Initiative. Many of you are familiar with this program's emphasis on setting goals, new emblems of belonging, and for the strength of youth conferences. But we must not let those cloud our view of the principles the program is built on and their purpose to help get the gospel of Jesus Christ deep in the hearts of our children and youth. I believe as we come to see these principles more clearly, we will recognize this as more than a program for members ages 8 to 18. We will see how the Lord is trying to help us, all of us, get his gospel deeper in our hearts. I pray the Holy Ghost will help us as we learn together. The first principle is relationships. Because they're such a natural part of the Church of Jesus Christ, we sometimes forget the importance of relationships in our ongoing journey to Christ. We're not expected to find or walk the covenant path alone. We need love and support from parents, other family members, friends, and leaders who are also walking the path. These kind of relationships take time, time to be together, Time to laugh, play, learn, and serve together. Time to appreciate each other's interests and challenges. Time to be open and honest with each other as we strive to be better together. These relationships are one of the primary purposes of gathering as families, quorums, classes, and congregations. They're the foundation for effective ministering. Elder Dale G. Renlin gave us a key to developing these kind of relationships when he said, to effectively serve others, we must see them through Heavenly Father's eyes. Only then can we begin to comprehend the true worth of a soul. Only then can we sense the love that Heavenly Father has for all his children. Seeing others as God does is a gift. I invite all of us to seek for this gift. As our eyes are open to see, we will also be able to help others see themselves as God does. President Henry B. Irene emphasized the power of this when he said, what will matter most is what others learn from you about who they really are and what they can really become. My guess is they won't learn it so much from lectures. They will get it from feelings of who you are, who you think they are, and what you think they might become. Helping others understand their true identity and purpose is one of the greatest gifts we can give. Seeing others and ourselves, as God does, knits our hearts together 
in unity and in love. With ever-increasing secular forces pulling at us, we need the strength that comes from loving relationships. So as we plan activities, meetings, and other gatherings, let us remember an overarching purpose of these gatherings is to build loving relationships that unite us and help get the gospel of Jesus Christ deeper in our hearts. Of course, it's not enough just to be bound together. There are many groups and organizations that achieve unity around a variety of causes, but the unity we seek is to be one in Christ, to connect ourselves with Him. To connect our hearts with heaven, we need individual spiritual experiences, as Elder Anderson just eloquently spoke to us about. Those experiences come as the Holy Ghost carries the Word and love of God to our mind and heart. This revelation comes through the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon, through inspired words of living prophets and other faithful disciples, and through the still small voice. These words are more than ink on a page, sound waves in our ears or thoughts in our minds and feelings in our hearts. The Word of God is spiritual power. It is truth and light. It is how we hear Him. The Word initiates and increases our faith in Christ and fuels within us a desire to become more like the Savior. That is, to repent and walk the covenant path. Last April, President Russell M. Nelson helped us understand the central role of repentance in this revelatory journey. He said, when we choose to repent, we choose to change. We allow the Savior to transform us into the best version of ourselves. We choose to become more like Jesus Christ. This process of change, fueled by the Word of God, is how we connect with heaven. Underlying President Nelson's invitation to repent is the principle of agency. We must choose repentance for ourselves. The gospel can't be forced into our hearts. As Elder Renlund said, our Heavenly Father's goal in parenting is not to have His children do what is right. It's to have His children choose to do what is right. In the programs replaced by children and youth, there were over 500 different requirements to complete in order to receive various recognition. Today, there is essentially one. It is an invitation to choose to become more like the Savior. We do this by receiving the Word of God through the Holy Ghost and allowing Christ to change us into the best version of ourselves. This is far more than an exercise in goal setting or self-improvement. Goals are simply a tool that help us connect with heaven through revelation, agency, and repentance to come unto Christ and receive his gospel deeper in our hearts. Finally, to get the gospel of Jesus Christ deep in our hearts, we need to engage in it, to give our time and talents to it, to sacrifice for it. We all want to live a life of meaning, and this is especially true of the rising generation. They desire a cause. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest cause in the world. President Ezra Taft Benson said, we are commanded by God to take this gospel to all the world. That is the cause that must unite us today. Only the gospel will save the world from the calamity of its own self-destruction. Only the gospel will unite men and women of all races and nationalities in peace. Only the gospel will bring joy, happiness, and salvation to the human family. Elder David A. Bedmar promised, as we empower the youth by inviting and allowing them to act, the church will move forward in miraculous ways. Too often we have not invited and allowed the youth to sacrifice for this great cause of Christ. Elder Neal A. Maxwell observed, if our youth are too underwhelmed by God's work, they're more likely to be overwhelmed by the world. The Children and Youth program, program focuses on empowering the youth. They choose their own goals, 
Corman class presidencies are placed in their proper role. The Ward Youth Council, just like the Ward Council, focuses on the work of salvation and exaltation. And quorums and classes begin their meetings by counseling about how to do the work God has given them. President Nelson said to the youth of the church, if you choose to, if you want to, you can be a big part of something big, something grand, something majestic. You are among the best the Lord has ever sent to this world. You have the capacity to be smarter and wiser. and have more impact on the world than any previous generation. On another occasion, President Nelson told the youth, I have complete confidence in you. I love you, and so does the Lord. We're his people, engaged together in his holy work. Young people, can you feel the trust President Nelson has in you and how important you are to this work? Parents and adult leaders, I invite you to see the youth as President Nelson does. As the youth feel your love and trust, as you encourage and teach them how to lead, and then get out of their way, they will amaze you with their insights, abilities, and commitment to the gospel. They will feel the joy of choosing to engage in and sacrifice for the cause of Christ. His gospel will get deeper into their hearts and the work will move forward in miraculous ways. I promise as we focus on these principles, relationships, revelation, agency, repentance, and sacrifice, the gospel of Jesus Christ will seek deeper in all our hearts. We will see the restoration move forward to its ultimate purpose, the redemption of Israel and the establishment of Zion, where Christ will reign as King of Kings. I testify that God continues to do all things necessary to prepare his people for that day. May we see his hand in this glorious work as we all strive to come unto Christ and be perfected in him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. We express gratitude to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. The choir will now favor us with Joseph Smith's first prayer. Our concluding speaker for this marvelous session will be President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency. Following his remarks, the choir will close the meeting by singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Michelle Craig, first counselor in the Young Women General Presidency.
the prayer of Elder Maines at the beginning of this first session of General Conference is being answered. Inspiration has come to us through wonderful messages and beautiful music. The promise of President Russell M. Nelson that this conference will be memorable is already beginning to be fulfilled. President Nelson has designated this year as a bicentennial period commemorating 200 years since God the Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph Smith in a vision. President Nelson invited us to make a personal plan to prepare ourselves for this historic conference, which commemoration, he said, would be a hinge point in the history of the Church. And your part is vital, he said. Like me, perhaps you heard his message and asked yourself, in what way is my part vital? Perhaps you read and prayed about the events of the Restoration. Perhaps more than ever before, you read the accounts of those few times when God the Father introduced His beloved Son. Perhaps you read of the instances when the Savior spoke to the children of our Heavenly Father. I know I did all those things and more. I found references in my reading to the priesthood of God and the opening of dispensations. I was humbled as I realized that my preparation for this conference was a hinge point in my personal history. I felt changes in my heart. I felt new gratitude. I felt with joy the prospect of being invited to participate in this celebration of the ongoing restoration. I imagine that others are feeling because of careful preparation, more joyful, more optimistic, more determined to serve in any capacity needed by the Lord. The transcendent events we honor were the beginning of the prophesied last dispensation in which the Lord is preparing His Church and His people, those who bear His name, to receive Him. As part of our preparation for His coming, He will lift each of us so we may rise to spiritual challenges and opportunities unlike any seen in the history of this world. In September 1840, the Prophet Joseph Smith and his counselors in the First Presidency declared the following. Open quote, the work of the Lord in these last days is one of vast magnitude and almost beyond the comprehension of mortals. Its glories are past description and its grandeur unsurpassable. It is the theme which has animated the bosom of prophets and righteous men from the creation of the world down through every succeeding generation to the present time. And it is truly the dispensation of the fullness of times when all things which are in Christ Jesus, whether in heaven or on the earth, shall be gathered together in Him when all things shall be restored, as spoken of by the, all the holy prophets since the world began. For it will take place the glorious fulfillment of the promises made to the fathers while the manifestations of the power of the Most High will be great, glorious, and sublime. They went on to say, We feel disposed to go forward and unite our energies for the upbuilding of the kingdom and establishing the priesthood in their fullness and glory. The work which has to be accomplished in the last days is one of vast importance and will call into action the energy, skill, talent, and ability of the saints, so that it may, be roll, that it may roll forth with that glory and majesty described by the prophet Daniel, and will consequently require the concentration of the saints 
to accomplish works of such magnitude and grandeur, close quote. Now, many of the specifics of what we will do and when we will do it in the unfolding restoration are not yet revealed. Yet the First Presidency, even in those early days, knew some of the breadth and depth of the work the Lord has set before us. Here are a few examples of what we do know will take place. Through his saints, the Lord will offer the gift of his gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Technology and miracles will continue to play a part, as will individual fishers of men who minister with power and increasing faith. We as a people will become more united amidst increasing conflict. We will be gathered in the spiritual strength of groups and families filled with gospel light. Even an unbelieving world will recognize the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and realize that the power of God is upon it. Faithful and brave disciples will fearlessly, humbly, and openly take upon them the name of Christ in their everyday lives. How then can each of us participate in this work of such magnitude and grandeur? President Nelson has taught how to grow in spiritual power. When we take repentance as a joyful opportunity because of our growing faith that Jesus is the Christ, when we understand and believe that the Heavenly Father hears our every prayer, when we strive to obey and live the commandments, we grow in our power to receive continuing revelation. The Holy Ghost can be our constant companion. A feeling of light will stay with us even as the world around us becomes darker. Joseph Smith is an example of how to grow in such spiritual power. He showed us that the prayer of faith is the key to revelation from God. He prayed in faith, believing that God the Father would answer his prayer. He prayed in faith, believing that only through the Jesus Christ could he be freed from the guilt he felt for his sins. And he prayed in faith, believing that he needed to find the true church of Jesus Christ to gain that forgiveness. Throughout his prophetic ministry, Joseph Smith used prayers of faith to obtain continuous revelation. As we face today's challenges and those yet to come, we too will need to practice the same pattern. President Brigham Young said, quote, I do not know any other way for the Latter-day Saints than for every breath to be virtually a prayer for God to guide and direct his people, close quote. Those words from the sacrament prayer should then describe our daily life. Always remember him. Him refers to Jesus Christ. The next words, and keep his commandments, suggest what it means for us to remember him. As we remember Jesus Christ always, we might ask in silent prayer, what would he have me do? Such prayer offered in faith in Jesus Christ, ushered in this last dispensation. It will be the heart at the heart of the part each of us will play in its continuing unfolding. I have found, as you have, wonderful examples of such prayer. First is Joseph Smith. He asked in childlike faith what the Lord would have him do. His answer changed the history of the world. To me, an important lesson comes from Joseph's responses, response to Satan's assault as Joseph knelt to pray. I know from 
experience that Satan and his servants try to make us feel that we must not pray. When Joseph Smith exerted all his powers to call upon God to deliver him from the power that tried to bind him, his prayer for relief was answered and Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him. Satan's attempt to thwart the beginning of the restoration was so severe because Joseph's prayer was so important. You and I will have small, smaller parts to play in the ongoing restoration, yet the enemy of the restoration will try to stop us from praying. The example of Joseph Smith's faith and his determination can strengthen us in our resolve. This is one of many reasons why my prayers always include thanks to Heavenly Father for the prophet Joseph. Enos in the Book of Mormon is another model for my prayer of faith as I try to play my part in the continuing restoration. Whatever your part will be, you could take him as a personal mentor. Like Joseph, Enos prayed in faith. He described his experience this way, and my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for mine own soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him, yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high, that it reached the heavens. And there came a voice unto me, saying, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou shalt be blessed. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away. And I said, Lord, how is it done? And he said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, and many years pass away before he shall manifest himself in the flesh, wherefore, go to, go to, thy faith hath made thee whole. The lesson that has blessed me in these words, because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, Joseph had faith in Christ to go into the grove and also to pray for release from the powers of Satan. He had not yet seen the Father and the Son, but he prayed in faith with all the energy of his heart. The experience of Enos has taught me the same precious lesson. When I pray with faith, I have the Savior as my advocate with the Father, and I can feel that my prayer reaches heaven. Answers come. Blessings are received. There is peace and joy, even in hard times. I remember when, as the newest member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, <laughs> I knelt in prayer with Elder David B. Haight. He was about the age I am now, with challenges I now experience myself. I remember perfectly now his voice as he prayed. I didn't open my eyes to look, but it sounded to me as if he were smiling. He spoke with Heavenly Father with joy in his voice. I can hear in my mind his happiness when he said, in the name of Jesus Christ. It sounded to me as if Elder Haight felt the Savior was affirming at that moment the message he had prayed to the Father. And I was sure it would be received with a smile. Our ability to make our vital contribution to the wonderful continuing restoration will increase as we grow in our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Heavenly Father as our loving Father. As we pray in faith, we become a vital part in the Lord's work as he prepares the world for his second coming. I pray that we all may find joy in doing the work he invites each of us to perform. I testify that I know that Jesus Christ lives. This is his church and kingdom on earth. 
Joseph Smith is the prophet of the restoration. President Russell M. Nelson is the Lord's prophet on the earth today. He holds all the keys of the priesthood in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I so testify with joy, solemnly, and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please.
Father in heaven, how grateful we are for the blessing of having heard thy word through some of thy chosen servants. We are grateful for the things that we have learned and felt through words which have been spoken and through promptings of the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be alive at this time on the earth when the gospel has been restored, when so many are preparing for the return of thy Son, Jesus Christ. We love him. We are grateful for his perfect example and his great atoning sacrifice in our behalf. We are grateful for his grace, which can change our hearts, which brings joy and peace, which can increase our capacity to do good and be good and become better. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might always hear thy voice and do thy will. We pray for eyes to see and ears to hear those things that we would not normally see and hear. And we say these things in the name of thy beloved Son, the Prince of Peace, the Master Healer, even Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.